Hello, and welcome to Rich in Relationship. And today we've got my new friend, Emma Viglucci, licensed marriage and family therapist back. And we're gonna be talking about sort of the second piece. Yet yeah, the first time she was here, we talked about the five elements of a successful marriage. And today we're gonna to talk about the relationship enrichment lifestyle. Emma, thank you so much for coming back. I so enjoy you. How are you today? Thank you so much. I'm so excited to be here and I'm doing fabulous. Awesome. And so the question I always ask, and you get to answer it twice, is how did your heart lead you into, let's talk about how did your heart lead you into the relationship enrichment lifestyle today? Yes. So I've been with my husband for a very long time and it's been a journey. And in that journey, I learned to practice what I preach. And so that's what created the relationship enrichment lifestyle. It's part of what I do, how I look at things, how I do my own life and what I bring to the work and what I teach people. So, I love it. How did you meet? We met in college. Excellent. Wow. That is, uh, well, you know, you're, <laughs> you're pretty young. Time. That could have been not that long ago, except that I know you've been practicing a while. So you think I'm younger than I am. So, so actually yeah. my wife and I met in college also. It's so, okay. so funny coincidence. It's All right. So nice let's, it goes full circle, right? You do come back. It's so interesting. Yeah. Well, yeah. you met in college and did you, I know I got to know the dirt. Did, okay. uh, so did you start dating right there in college? What was the deal? So this is embarrassing to share. We met two weeks into college and we've pretty much been together since. There were a couple of gaps in college and um, a few years back, we had a little bump, but for the most part, steady and uh, just working, plowing through. You know, I think it's actually normal that relationships have little bumps, especially ones that last, right? Like the quality in our culture today, we've been talking a lot about resilience, resilience, resilience. And what nobody really talks about when it comes to resilience is that resilience is born out of, out of conflict to some extent. It's born out of controversy. It's born out of the tough times. And so I think a healthy marriage, there are gonna be times when people maybe, you know, they get focused on other things and they go, oh my God, you know, and then that moment. What of, I want it. I was so young, you know, right. like that kind of thing. Uh, are we going to yeah. come back together or are we going to do something else? That's that moment that yeah. that decides how resilient the relationship really is. Yeah, my wife and I met in college, but we got reacquainted at a reunion. So we're, we may be a little behind you time wise in terms of our actual marriage. All right. So anyway, let's talk about this relationship enrichment lifestyle and probably um, it would be good to remind the audience, maybe just in a nutshell, what are those five elements that we talked yeah, about 100%. last time? So it's the successful relationship strategy. It has the five elements. The five elements are context and mindset, communication and alignment, clarity and dynamics, connection and intimacy, and collaboration and partnership. Sweet. And a quick, a quick overview, those came to be from, from the years of experience with doing the therapy with so many couples. Mm -hmm. It narrowed down the whole therapeutic process into those five areas that if we focused on each enough and we do nice work there, you pretty much could have your transformation. Yeah, everybody wants to focus on collaboration. <laughs> Nobody it wants to know about collaboration. that. That's so funny, right? People want to just go in, problem solve. But if you don't have some of this stuff under your belt, you can collaborate until you're blue in the face. Nothing's going to come of it, right? You're not, you can't really collaborate if you're hating your partner. Yeah. So some of the things need to come first too. Yeah, I, I get clients who have done, I don't want to disparage any other practice, but they've maybe they've seen a marriage counselor or maybe they've seen uh, a couple's counselor or maybe they've seen um, a therapist who's working with couples and uh, very often what they report as missing in that is that they didn't really delve into the conflict, that that was kept so under wraps that they didn't really get to figure that part out. Yep. So, uh, so, so it's not, that's not about a practice, that's just about practitioners. So, that, you know, it, it's so important in the relationship to really understand what, if you're having the fight, I like to call it, over and over and over, the one that just shreds the relationship and never goes anywhere. If you don't really understand what's driving it, what's underneath it, all the elements of it, it's really hard to, to move on from that, I'm going to say. That is uh, so funny. The name, the title of my newsletter today is called When You Have the Same Fight. 
Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, so yeah, so if you don't understand what's happening, you keep repeating the same thing over and over and over again. You could you collaborate and put little systems in place all you want, but that fight's gonna keep coming up, right? There's something driving it, so for sure. Yeah, all right, so we've got these, these five elements of a healthy relationship. How does the relation, relationship, relationship enrichment lifestyle tie into that? I okay. love that. I love that. I, I, an enrichment lifestyle. I like it. Yes, thank you. It feels so, like it's like it's like financial freedom. It's got a it's just got a great feeling to it. That's absolutely right. So, <laughs> so I use the word enrichment to capture the essence of doing work on evolving yourself and your relationship. Right. So that's like it a neutral, beautiful, positive word to say, listen, you got to put in the work, dude, kind of thing, right? So relationship enrichment lifestyle. And that means that we're going to focus on making something beautiful and not take it for granted. And it has three parts. Part one is having a vision of what you want your life to be in your, mm -hmm. in your relationship. Most people just banging around. So that's number one. Number two, then working through the five elements and everybody has some work to do. It doesn't have to be a major therapeutic process, but just being conscientious of like, how am I showing up? Am I targeting those five elements properly in my life? Mm -hmm. And then finally, integrating that into your daily routine, into your ideal day. And then you put in habits throughout the day to make it really practical. So all your learnings, all your insights, whatever you're working on, you translate into measurable behaviors and that's how you create change. You can create change by just having insights. So you had to carry it through the mechanisms. You could have an, an, an awareness, but then that takes you only so far. You have to actually have practical behavioral things that you put in place to change the, the ongoing transactions and, and experiences between and, and with each other. So that's what the, the last piece is building it into the every day. Yeah. And, you know, for our listeners, we've talked in previous podcasts about elements of resilience, like building resilience in your children. And what comes back again and again is I'm not that word resilient is really in this conversation today is that uh, if you want to communicate values to your children, or if you want to communicate, um, ideas or strategies, life strategies, the best way to do that is through habits and traditions. And so it makes perfect sense that if we want to have a, an enriching lifestyle in our relationship, to use those words, that we need to apply those same principles here. It makes perfect sense. Yes, exactly. And when you put intentionality, then you're able to make it happen, right? If you just decide, oh, I'm going to be nice. Well, what does that mean? And how are you going to be nice, right? But if you say, you know, on a daily basis, I'm going to try to, like, for example, the, the newsletter that I did last week was on being delightful to your partner, delighting mm -hmm. your partner, right? So once a day, I'm going to do something that delights my partner. So this might be that. that he or she wants, right? And then, but usually we know what our partner wants, but we don't want to give it, right? Like, eh, eh, you know? <laughs> not, not until I get what I want. Right? So it's like, we know, come on, man. So just give it. And then it's just to please them. It just, it's no skin of our backs usually. So I'm curious, how would you tie that into like the five love languages? Yes. So with the five love languages, usually what, usually what people do if they don't know their five love languages is that they give love the way that they like to receive love, not mm -hmm. the way that their partner likes to receive love. So usually what couples say or partners say is, well, I'm twisting myself into a pretzel in here. She doesn't even notice that I'm doing this. I, I keep buying her flowers and doing. chocolates and she doesn't appreciate it. I don't understand. <laughs> Right? That's because they don't register what you're doing because they don't care about that. They want their own thing that they want. And you That's don't want to do that. From my life, by the way. My wife does not care about flowers or chocolate. You know, that was an actual experience. So you have but to yeah. figure that out, right? That, that oof, how you replace chocolate. It took a little while for it to sink in. <laughs> <laughs> it took a little while. Um, so once I know my partner's love language, then I could build that into what I do throughout the day right? If I give praise, if I give acts of service, if I give gifts. So when I delight my partner, I might use the, their love language to delight them as opposed to whatever I want to give. And you know, if, if you're, you all don't know about the five love languages, just Google five love languages. It's out there. There's a quiz you can take that'll help you and your partner identify your love languages. And then you can, then you'll know how to delight your, better, more ways to delight your partner. Exactly. I love that word, delight your partner. 
Isn't it pretty? Yeah. I can't, I can't own it. I borrow that from somebody else, but I was like, oh, beautiful. That's coming in. <laughs> Let's be real. There's not a lot of original ideas on the planet. There's just new ways to rearrange them. Every now and then a new one pops up though. Yeah. Yeah. I can't take the credit for that one, but you know, it's all good. All right. So uh, one element of in uh, an enriching lifestyle is to have a habit or a commitment to delighting our partner. What are some other ways that we can enrich our relationship? Yeah. So let me just talk about that first more about the habits. Um, oh, sure. Yeah. I teach couples how to have connection habits, right? So usually what people do is they get up, they put their makeup on, their shade, whatever it is. Well, nowadays well, we don't they go to the bathroom, bathroom first. Maybe. <laughs> yes, no, most the people get up and pee, let's be honest. They or, or they go to the bathroom first, you're right. Some people might have their coffee first, right? Whatever. So we do our, our business. Um, and then we make it ready for the day. And we walk up next to the person. Sometimes we don't even acknowledge them. It's crazy, right? And the stories that I hear from couples, it's just really unbelievable how people run their lives. And so you start the day off already, not on the same not on the, in the same energy, in the same flow, in the same foot or on the same page, whatever. So the connection have a start from the moment you wake up. It could be anything, right? Mm -hmm. Do you run over and give a peck? Do you meet downstairs for coffee? And so you, you start building, you build things. And especially now that we're all home all the time and working together, like how do you have connection points throughout the day that are meaningful? Not just being in the same room together. That's not connection, right? That's a misunderstanding that people have. Men might consider that connection. We're together all the time. You're not talking to me. We're not together. <laughs> That's what women think, right? That usually gets couples. And so you could spend all the time together. You could be in the same room, but you're not really connecting from a woman's brain anyway. So I, I think if we're, if we're honest from a man's experience as well, you know, yeah. it, it, it like, it may feel like we were in the room together, check the box. But it, I think if any, if any man were really honest experientially, they weren't really present with their partner. I think that's what we're talking about here is how emotionally present are you? If you're in the room and you're doing separate things, you're, you're on parallel tracks. Yes. So I think, so thank you. So I think that if guys are in touch with more of themselves, they will have that awareness. Otherwise they will not. And they would say, we're spending all this time together. I need some me time. So it depends on the level of development and emotional development that we have, um, men and women, right? Mm -hmm. so, so for the women in those instances, they might say something like spending all this time together doesn't count and that pisses men off because they invested all this time in the relationship, <laughs> right? And so doing that differently so that they feel that that connection is there, you don't have to spend all this time together, right? But do it right and then you could be with each other and then that feels better. So. You build that throughout the day. Being together all the time doesn't count. Curate that connection time or that couple of times separate from whatever else is going on. Those could be another, you know, so what the flavor of that could be another connection habit. And then transitioning at the end of the work day into the evening, just whatever rituals are there in the evening before bedtime. So all these different things, like throughout the day, you could put all kinds of things in there. My husband and I are back to back with meetings most of the time. So he, he, I'm on my dining room table right now. I don't like to use my office upstairs. So sometimes I, sometimes I make my way upstairs if I need more privacy and um, more isolation, but I just like to see my whole house and like, <laughs> and be in the center of everything. So he might come downstairs and walk by and like poke and hang out and whatever when he, in between things. Um, and sometimes we're so back to back that we might just text each other. He's upstairs and he might send a smiley face or a thumbs up or something like with, in connection, even though it's hard, right? So little things, they all count. Like, oh, he's thinking about me. It's nice. Yeah, and so men, just to make this real for you, the, like the distinction between being in the room together and being connected. You know, when, when you're out with the guys, all right, if you're working on a project together, maybe you're doing separate things, but you're working on the same project. So you're, there's, there's a unity of purpose there. Uh, so, it, and that's the distinction. If, if you're working in the same space as someone, but you're not working on this on a related thing, there is an even unity of purpose. And in your wife's mind, you could be working on the same project, but if you don't talk and interact, then you're not really being related. So you just, you need to like plant this seed in your head that working with guys is one thing, you know, guys like to work side by side. They don't mind working on the same project separately. Then they'll get together and say, oh, look at how we helped each other. Isn't this amazing? Because guys tend to be, we tend to be sort of goal oriented, but we, uh, 
uh, I'm going to stop saying guys and women, the feminine aspect of human beings is probably a better way to put it, yeah. is more about relationship and connection. And so if we want to have a relationship with a, with a partner of any kind, man or woman, you know, we're going to need to be a real relationship. We're going to need to have some contact with that feminine aspect within ourselves. And when we're in the same room, make sure that we have a sense that there's connectedness and relatedness going on, not just sort of, well, I'm doing my thing, you're doing your thing and we're together. That just, that's not, that's a male concept of relatedness. It's not a female concept of relatedness. So just like work with that fellas. That was awesome. Or, or, oh. or women who are super in touch with your masculine side and not paying attention to that, work with that idea. Lovely, exactly. So men tend to feel connected when they're working on a common purpose. I like that you use the word purpose and common goal. But when they're in the relationship with the women, uh, or female energy, there wasn't even a common activity. People are in the same room doing different things, even worse, right? And so I love that you just added that piece of being intentional about, oh, let's, let's chat, touch base on this or checking in. Now, oh, what do you think about that? You know, like, so e even like watching TV, watching programs together, men don't want to talk through programs. Women want to process what's happening, right? So guys are like, shh, shh. <laughs> Usually, right? I don't want to overgeneralize, uh, but that male energy is more more in the processing and understanding, and it's usually more internal. The women tend, to, or the female energy tends to process more externally, and mm -hmm. so that creates a conflict in and of itself. So just being aware of that is very helpful, and just being intentional about like we're here to have a moment together, so let's be together. And what does that look like? So it sounds yes, that it sounds like part of. Uh, I was just thinking back on where we started. Part of the enrichment lifestyle is keeping the five elements in your life on a daily basis also I like it's not like you just go through the five elements and okay did that oh, check <laughs> it sounds like the the part of practices is having awareness of those five elements in your daily experience tell us more about that yes so throughout the day you might be intentional or mind mindful i should say mindful about your thought process right so that's element one how am i looking at my partner Am I looking at my partner, how he's failing me? He or she's failing me. Is he or she getting on my nerves? Is he or she not meeting my needs? Is he or she doing something that I don't like or are they not taking care of themselves? I'm in their circle, right? Poor boundaries. Um, so just watching that internal chatter and even what comes out of our mouth, that mindset is usually terrible for people. So that's number one. So just watching yourself, how you're looking at things. Great, can we pause there a second? So you're not just talking about the conscious thoughts. You're talking about that stuff that's happening almost it's like semi-consciously, you know, just those little thoughts of, oh, oh, that, oh, look at, she didn't why, do, he didn't why do that. Oh, why me? didn't he, he left his sock there or whatever, just those <laughs> like stray thoughts that pop up. That's right. And that's so right. That, that's kind of, those little pieces are almost like touching an underlying feeling that's happening unconsciously so that you have some awareness of where you're coming from. Yes. So a little bit more about that. So one, we have dirty thinking that we like to we like to point the finger and look at how about how somebody else is not measuring up to what we want as opposed to they could be their own people and do whatever they want, right? I could make requests by what I want from my circle, from my own personal accountability and personal ownership, and I have to ask properly. The other person has a choice to meet that or not, right? But usually we don't we don't take that approach. We make demands. We have unspoken expectations. We expect the mm -hmm. other person our mind and take care of things it's just we have all these ridiculous things that we do yep but even worse we don't look at our partner as our partner with a capital p like i like to say right our partner is disposable oh if he or she doesn't behave properly they're out i could get another one right so at 30 30 plus years in a relationship here no partners are not disposable you if you work on it you can make it happen I know that that's that's <laughs> that's probably touchy for some people, right? Well, um, can I can I just touch that a second, a little bit? Yeah. I, I think it's kind of. I mean, part. Let's be real. Today, partners are disposable. But what is that? But what does that mean? If you think of your partner as being disposable, what does that mean? You know, what it means is you invest five, 10, 15, 20, whatever years into a relationship, and you hit a point where it's like, oh, this isn't so easy. So what's been going on? You know, what's been going on is you've both been developing and growing and your relationship hopefully is developing and growing. Maybe you're stuck because you stopped focusing on the relationship for a while and it didn't develop and grow. But basically you're throwing away the, all that 
investment. You've invested energy and time into evolving a working relationship. You're throwing all that work away. And then when you start over, you literally start over. You start over with falling in love. And then you, you know, two to three years later, one or both of you are done with falling in love. And then you move on to the next sort of phase. And you like, it's really like you go back to go, uh, you know, you, you and begin the whole game all over again. And so I, I would have, yeah, you can get divorced and throw it away, but think about what are you really throwing away? Are you throwing away them? Or are you throwing away all the growth and all the investment and all the development that you had there? And is it going to really be different with another person? Thank you. I'm going to piggyback on that. I'm going to play devil's advocate for a second because I know that this concept is not very popular, right? People do consider relationships responsible in this culture that we live in. So what I want to say about that is sometimes we outgrow our person or our person was meant to be with us for a period of time for our own personal journey and our own personal development and that we're ready for the next level of our lives. I'm okay with that, right? That makes sense. But I love what you said. So that was the devil advocate part, not the confirmation part. This is my strongest belief, right? So I think that if we invest in it, we can continue to evolve and grow together. There's a gift there. That match didn't happen for no, for no reason. And in that gift is part of our journey and is part of our development and is part of our awesomeness. And at some point you might be like, mm, well, mm, I think this match is done now. You could always still get there. Hey, listen, I could still get there myself. Who knows, right? Um, but the point is why throw out all that growth and development, all that potential synergy. You put in all that work. Some people might say I didn't put any work. It was just all torture. <laughs> Well, Listen, some, and sometimes, and sometimes it is. Right. But the fact that you stuck it out is work, right? So that's what I'm calling that work. Um, so we want to do this consciously. We want to do this intentionally and mindfully. And then it's as hurtful and there's awareness there. And that's when your partner becomes partner with a couple of P because you're together for a reason. You yeah. figure it out, you resolve the things, you figure out your patterns. Share a sense of purpose, share a sense of vision, like a business. So, you know, and I'll, I'll throw this out for the people, if you're really suffering in a relationship, it might be that you or your partner have something else going on. Like I've had clients who had a partner that was clinically depressed and no matter what would not get treated for it. And they, try, they worked at that relationship with that person who had that condition for five years. And in the end, they were just like, you know what? I can't wait another, they were, they're moving forward and the other person isn't. You know, so in that case, the relationship, the relationship's not moving forward because the other person's just like dug into to their position. And so that, that might be an example of you're not throwing away a relationship at that point. You're making a decision. How long am I really going to hang in here you know, for this person to either resolve this or am I going to live with this situation for the rest of my life? And that's your decision. But that's so, but it, so, you know, it goes back to this idea of what are you throw if you're going to throw it away, what are you throwing away? So, Rich, and that, in that case, and this is what I actually get, my clients, I think it sense from day one that I'm very pro-relationship. I'm going to keep fighting for that relationship until you tell me, Emma, freaking stop it already, right? So I'm going to help you. Um, but sometimes we don't want to do re the relationship at our expense. Where you describe, with that last example that you gave, um, we want to do the relationship so that we both keep growing and moving. But at some right. point, so it's not just for the sake of the relationship, it's for each of us, right? We're yep. creating something amazing individually and then together. In the relationship, I might not be progressed, it might not be developed in the way that you would like it, it might not be the best relationship ever, but there's still good stuff that you could continue to make it more and more awesome every day. Fantastic, that's where most people are at. But if this relationship is detrimental to you, and you're barely keeping your, your nose above the water and you're barely getting any oxygen in and it's like bringing you down, dude, you gotta get rid of that ankle, uh, anchor. Yeah. Right? So it's not at our own expense. That is not what I will ever suggest that. We don't do any of this work at our own expense. We don't do stuff for our partner at our own expense. That's not the point, right? We have to figure out how to do it so that we both benefit and we both move and grow. Got it. So that was element one, the mindset. The whole I promise thing. you, I won't take you down any more rabbit holes. <laughs> <laughs> I'm totally fine with it. But listen, I could talk about this stuff at Noastium and I know that we have a limited amount of time, so I want to make sure that we stay focused. Um, so that was mindset number one, uh, the element one mind mindset. Number two is communication. We could always continue to improve our communication skills, listening better, speaking better, speaking from our own power, not trumping on other people. Um, 
number three. So we have to be mindful of that. Just oh, oh, to before you go to number three. So what are some, yeah. what's something, a daily exercise or, or a tactic that people could have to just work on that communication thing? Yes. So the communication, when I teach this, there's a bunch of different communication dialogue things that we could do. And if people are interested, they could check out my blog on metrorelationship.com. I have a few blog posts. Relationship on, or relationships? Relationship. Metro oh, relationship. Like this, I'm, I'm rich in relationship. We're both singular. Got it. We're both singular. <laughs> uh, yeah. So metrorelationship.com forward slash blog. And um, there are a couple of posts there. One on relationship skills, one on relationship tools, one on relationship roadblocks. I mean, communications. Um, so all of those communication tools, skills, and roadblocks. Great. So people can learn more about those daily practices there. Awesome. Yeah. So then that's what we keep in mind right throughout the day as we're going through the lifestyle daily thing in my blocking communication, am I expressing myself clearly? Am I using all, all the, the dirty dozen of communication? Am I poking at my partner all day long? Mm -hmm. Am I setting us up for fighting, right? right. Am I instigating? Like all these things. So you could be mindful of that and watch your own communication style all day long. So that's number one. And then number two, you can actually be proactive and schedule talks and schedule appreciations, ask to do a repair, do a proper apology. So these are all things that we teach um, so that those are all part of communicating. Got it. Perfect. Next, next piece. So for number three, um, this is the, the toughest one. Uh, and this is the hardest one to teach. It's more experiential clarity and dynamics. We all know when we're stuck in our dynamics, right? We, we just feel stuck and we keep repeating that fight in that, in that thing that we've been talking about. Or maybe we're avoiding we're avoiding, and, and our defenses are usually, so if I get triggered, well, I'm not gonna bring it to myself because I, I changed this, but usually um, when somebody gets triggered, that person might fight back, might pursue, might try to go get what they want. That's usually the female energy. They have the tendency to have pursuer energy, nagging, clingy, complaining, <laughs> going, 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 trying to get the partner's attention. Um, the male energy is usually more of like, dude, we need some separateness, right? I need to be by myself. I need to process. I need to chill out. I need to regroup. I need to think like that kind of thing. So they kind of tend to go on, the, on their own way. That makes the female energy come chase some more. Those are usually the defenses. So it's not only built into our brains, but it's also part of defense mechanisms. And this is, part, it's not this black and white, but that's generally how it plays out. So if I get triggered and I come after you, you might then defend yourself by going away some more. So I come after you some more and we create that pattern. If I'm aware that that's how I defend, right? I, when I get wounded, I come after you. Then I might be like, what I would do on a daily basis, be like, okay, hmm, I didn't like that so much. What did I feel? Where's that coming from? And this is a little advanced, but if people could do this, fantastic. What just came up for me? What are my feelings? what got triggered, like, where's that coming from? What history is there? How can I share that with my partner? I suppose to like, you suck because you didn't take out the garbage, right? Um, or you abandoned me because I had to do all the chores by myself or whatever that looks like. Very female, sorry. <laughs> Very female examples. Um, so. I think guys feel like that too sometimes, don't worry. Okay, good. So if I bring just examples of potentially more domestic sexist, way of saying all these things, but usually the women do these tasks. These tasks. Um, so if I'm coming at it from that, from that whining at you place, as opposed to this is what happened for me, then if I say it properly, you might not shut down and go away. And then you might respond to me better. But if I come at you and poke at you and tell you that you suck and you criticize you, forget it. You know, well, you're going to either attack back or disappear, right? But if right. I speak about me and if I say about if I talk about my own feelings you might be able to stand there hold still and be like oh usually the people don't intentionally try to hurt us right so he or she wasn't out to get me and make me hurt but now that they're aware that I hurt they could give me something mm -hmm. very different reaction very different exchange that's what element three is got it, it a lot of awareness and four so forced connection. So we kind of talked a lot about that a little earlier. She's all those connection habits and making sure that we're present. Making sure that we're checking in, that we're, we're aware of what's going on. Might be, what are you doing today? In the beginning of the day, it might be how to, what, what, 
how did it go today? Actually, a, a neat trick that somebody taught me is instead of asking how did it go, you ask what was great about your day? Because <laughs> otherwise you hear all the blah, all the st bad stuff and that can go, that can, energy can actually lead you down a sinkhole. But if you hear about what was great, you know, that you can build a- Yeah, what feeling. was good about today? I actually asked my daughter that. What was good today? <laughs> yeah, my children are wise to that one. And number five. <laughs> yes, yeah, so they get smart. Um, number five is collaboration. And then um, collaboration has to do with how do you recreate life as simple as possible, as streamlined as possible. We divide and conquer. That's the systems. System. So first divide and conquer. Who's so going to get the kid to school? Who's going to make dinner? Who's going to, who's yeah. paying the bills? Yeah. Who's got their eye on the future? People say, well, we share that and everything's shared. And when things are shared, nobody owns it. And that's where the conflict could come. Mm -hmm. So we could say, fine, I own bringing the kids to school. But if something happens, or if I don't want to, you're my backup. We, we still do it together, but I own it. And I, I, I think if people get real about it, even the things they share, uh, I'll give you a, an, an example. I know a couple who have dogs and they say they share responsibility for the dogs. But the truth is that one of them really lets them out in the morning the other one feeds them another one walks them like they, they they share it but they, they each piece is unique to what is feels most comfortable or at least uncomfortable to the person who's doing it so even, you know, even shared is a bunch of uh, questionable languaging i was going to use another word yes <laughs> <laughs> I like that observation because I think that people might be doing it. They're just not really owning it. And in that ownership, it's like, okay, so yeah, we show responsibility of the dog, but I, this is how we break it up. And then fine. I know that this is mine and this is yours. And we could always cover for each other as needed, but I will need to ask for that coverage. Um, I'm still responsible because I say it, I'm the walk, dog walker. Yeah, just like if you take time off from work, Usually it's your responsibility to make sure you the things that you do when you go on vacation to make sure that somebody's covering the things that you do. Yep, yep. Beautiful. So everything assigned, everybody has their own responsibilities. People can share as they want to, but they're still the owners, divide and conquer the world. Systems, calendar share, calendars, like all kinds of different tools so that you can work together. And when you're synchronized like that, then it opens up that energy for something greater in life as opposed to running the minutia of life. Love it. I love it. I understand you have a webinar coming up. Tell us about that webinar, please. Yes. So our webinar is coming up next uh, two Mondays from now, uh, April 26th, Mothering for Relationship Success. Mothering so, for Relationship Success. Got it. It's going to be it. about how do we show love and love on our partner and on ourselves. So mothering could be for, for either, just to be clear, it could be for either partner, could be could do some mothering. <laughs> Yes, both partners, both genders can, both energies can be mothering or own that part or of them. Nurturing. Nurturing. Yeah. I, I use the word mothering because Mother's Day is coming out around the corner. So yeah, there you go. Just a, it's just a play in words, but definitely. Good marketing. I'm with you. Nurturing. I wish I thought of that. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Well, we're going to look forward to that. And um, I think we already mentioned your website, but just one more time, if people want to find you, what's the best way? Yes. MetroRelationship.com. Metro relationship. That's no S on the end relationship.com. Emma, I could talk to you forever. So we're definitely going to hang out some more one way or another. Yes. Thank you so much for coming on the show. I just, it's always such a pleasure. My pleasure also, and have a fabulous day and enjoy and good luck with the podcast. Yeah. And I'm going to make sure that I get a piece of that webinar. That sounds like a great, a great thing. I actually, I, I could stand as a father to learn a little more about being nurturing. We all can, we could always improve everything. Thank you.